the afternoon. Our first song will be number 719, 719. All oh, praise to him who reigns above, in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die, that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of mine, once ruined. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For our prayer, we'll sing number two zero, number twenty. Beyond this land of parting, losing and leaving, far beyond the losses, knocking in this and far beyond the taking and the bereaving, lies the summer land of bliss, land beyond so fair and bright, land beyond. Summer light, God is his light. Oh, happy summer land of bliss. Beyond this land of toiling, sowing and reaping, far beyond the shadows, dark and this, and far beyond the sighing, moaning and reaping. Lies the summer land of bliss, land beyond so fair and bright, land beyond where is no night, summer land, God is his light, oh happy summer land of bliss. Be Beyond this land of waiting, sinking and sighing, far beyond the sorrows, dark and in this, and far beyond the pain and sickness and dying, lies the summer land of bliss, land beyond. 
beyond, so fair and bright, land beyond, where is no night, summer night, God is his light, oh happy summer land of bliss. Pray with me. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the things that you've given us. There is so much that you have done, that you are doing, that we cannot begin to understand or comprehend. But we thank you for your care and your concern and your benevolence. We thank you especially for your son, for his coming down and, and showing us how to live and dying on the cross so that we can have fellowship with you and each other. We pray for the members of the congregation that are ill, that they could be restored to their health as soon as possible and back with us. We ask your blessings upon the leaders of our nation. We pray that as they make decisions, those decisions will be made in accordance with your will for the good of all people. Father, we pray for our brethren that are working the world over, spreading the gospel. And we pray that you would be with them and give them the strength that they need to continue, that your word can go out to those who haven't heard, that your light would shine, that they could be blessed with the things that we have today. Watch over us. Be with us. This we pray in your son's name. Amen. Number 304, 304. There's a beautiful place called heaven. It's hidden above the bright blue Where the good who from a ties are river Live in love and eternity through Above the bright blue The beautiful blue Jesus is waiting for me and for you land of sweet rest awaits us someday we'll break on our view tis promised by Christ the Redeemer to his father was faithful and true above the bright blue the beautiful blue Jesus is waiting for me and for you. Heaven is then not far from our sight. Beautiful city of life. We know not when shall call us, whether soon the glad summing shall be. But we know when we pass on the river, the glory of Jesus will see. Above the bright blue, the beautiful blue, Jesus is waiting for me and for
If you'd like to mark number 170, 170, that'll be the song of invitation. For our lesson this evening, if you'll stand, we'll sing number 525, 525. <clears throat> I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory line way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory line way. I'm in the glory line way. I'm in. to the call, the gospel call today, get in the glory line way, wonders come home, oh hasten to obey, for I'm in the glory line way, I'm in the glory line I'm in the glory line way. Heaven is nearer and the way growing clearer for I'm in the glory line way. Onward I go rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory line way. Book of Numbers, chapters 13 through 14, at least parts of those two chapters, will be the basis of our study together this evening. We do have a good number present for our Sunday evening worship service. We're grateful for your presence. Those who are visiting with us, we're especially glad that you're here and trust that you'll benefit from the time that you spend with us. The nation of Israel has now been formed down in the land of Egypt under the suppression of the people of Egypt they began to cry out unto God for deliverance God calls Moses along with Aaron to go back down into Egypt he had fled at this point <clears throat> go back down into Egypt and and lead those people out God's mighty hand was displayed on numerous occasions through the process of convincing Pharaoh to let those people go. They have now crossed the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army has now been drowned in that sea. They have crossed over the other side. They have reached a point, a place called Kadesh Barnea. And from that point, God has said to Moses, and this is in the very outset of chapter 13, Send thou men, <clears throat> that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers, shall ye send a man, every one, a ruler among them. Then you come down to verse 17, Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. 
and said unto them, Get ye up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or few, a strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they are now told to go into the land. It seems obvious from <clears throat> other contexts that the people had pretty much requested this. It's not just something that, that God said on the spur of the moment, by the way, you need to send some spies out up there to make sure the land's like I said it was. It, it seems to be in response to the cry or the, the uh, suggestion of the people that they send somebody up there to see if it was, in fact, a land like God had said. God had promised them this land. As you go back to the early part of chapter 13, I want you to notice a couple of things in the very outset of the study. He said, um, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. <clears throat> God says, I'm going to give you this land. Well, does that mean by virtue of the fact that, that God was going to give it to them? That there was absolutely nothing that they had to do in order to be the recipients of that gift? Well, absolutely not. As we learn later on in the history of, of these events, that, that they really had to go in there and to subdue the inhabitants of the land. As a matter of fact, they were told to either destroy them or drive them out. So just because God said, I'll give it to you, didn't mean there was absolutely nothing they could do. And people today who want to talk about salvation as being a gift and, and suggest that is an unconditional gift, obviously do not understand the nature of different types of gifts. This land of Canaan was a gift, but it was theirs. It was theirs upon condition that they would do what they needed to do when they got there. Notice another point from the earlier verses in this chapter. Those men that were sent out were not just anybody. You'll notice in verse latter part of verse 2 that they were everyone a ruler among them. Latter part of verse 3. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. So it wasn't, wasn't just anybody that they sent out up there. It really wasn't volunteers. They chose the rulers, the heads, the leaders of the people. Now that should say something about the nature of those men should say something about their character, something about their nature, that they would have been strong, that they would have been courageous, that they could have fulfilled this responsibility without, uh, without any problem whatsoever. You go into the land and you check it out and you see all of the different areas, beginning in verse 17, that, that they were, were told to check out exactly what is there, the nature of the people, the nature of the cities, the nature of the land, the nature of the, the fruits of that land, you check it out, <clears throat> every aspect of it. God had already said, it's a land that flows with milk and honey. It is a very prosperous land. God was not sending them somewhere where it would be difficult for them to survive, but rather sending them into very wealthy, prosperous, good land. So Israel is now on its way, coming out of Egypt, across the, across the Red Sea, in the wilderness at this point, Kadesh Barnea, these men were sent into that promised land where they were headed at this point. Chapter 13, the latter part of it, <clears throat> might be suggested as one of the saddest chapters in the history of 
of the nation of Israel. Now there were a lot of sad chapters because Israel was, was up and down in their service to God. And we understand that. But here we begin to see very early in their history how they would refuse following demonstration after demonstration of the power of God, how they would forget the power of God, overlook the power of God, turn away from the commands of God, and use their own reasoning, their own thinking. Later on, you could understand then why the prophet Jeremiah would say in chapter 10 and verse 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. How often has Jeremiah seen that as a reality among this very nation of people? They tried to direct their own steps. They turned away from God's instruction. And every time, it led to trouble. Some lessons there for us, is there not? Whenever God gives us instruction, gives us direction, and we ignore God's direction and, and begin to chart our own course, direct our own steps, inevitably, trouble is going to come. There, there's, there's no other way for it to happen. <clears throat> then you come on down into chapter 13, and it, it describes how they, when they went up into the land to search it out, what, what they found in that regard. And uh, verse 25, they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. So here is, a, here is a challenge that is issued. Following their coming back, they've seen the land, they, they saw what was there. But in verse 26, they went and came to Moses and to Aaron, <clears throat> all the congregation of the children of Israel, under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh, and brought back word in them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Now if you could just put a period right there, <clears throat> and that be the end of the story for the most part, of these spies, that would be a good thing. Remember why they were sent into the land. They have gone into the land. They have done what they were instructed to do, verses 21 through 25. They have now come back. They have given a report to Moses and to Aaron as to what they found in the land. And if they had just stopped right there, they would have served their purpose. But they went beyond what their designated instruction was. They went beyond what, what they had been instructed to do. So not only did they, did they bring back reports of the land, but then, in spite of what God had said, you go into the land, I'm going to give you that land, they began to re make recommendations against what God had said for them to do. That's going to bring trouble, isn't it? Nevertheless, <clears throat> the people be strong that dwell in the land. And, and you'll see a, a series of things here, at least three suggestions that they make that they believe is, is good enough reason not to do what God has said do. Now you and I know, and they should have known, that it doesn't matter how long of a list of good excuses, we might list there is absolutely no excuse that is sufficient to ignore what God has said do. But they think they've got three good reasons at least. Number one, the people that dwell in the land are strong. So, what's that got to do with anything? The cities are walled and very great. True, that's what they saw. We saw the children of Anak there. Later on we learned that in verse 33 these were giants. We saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants. And we were in our own sight as, as grasshoppers as we were, and so were we in their sight. 
It's always been an interesting question in my mind. Who told them once they had seen the giants that they were grasshoppers in the sight of the giants? Now they, they could have reached that conclusion of themselves. We were in our sight as grasshoppers. I can understand that part. And so we were in their sight. Who told them that? Well, the record doesn't say. My conclusion would be in that regard, you know, and if you think about human nature just a little bit, we begin to think that other people think like we think sometimes. And I think that's what they did right here. Began to think in their own minds, well, if, if we look so small in their sight, what must we look, or in our sight, what must we look like in their sight? But we need to see ourselves <clears throat> through the eyes of God, not through the eyes of men. You see, God had already said, I'm going to give you that land. That had nothing to do with the, with the, uh, the people being strong, had nothing to do with them being giants, had nothing to do with their cities being walled. It had nothing to do with it. God said, I'm going to give you that land. That should have settled it, but it didn't. So here they have spent 40 days in searching the land, verse 25. They returned with good evidence, verse 26. But as you continue to read the story, some of them did not share the confidence of Joshua and Caleb from this point forward. They had attitudes of, of defeat and discouragement. <clears throat> And you understand that. Have you ever taken on a task concerning which before you ever began the task, I can't do this. I, I've been asked to try. I've been asked to do. I, I know I can't do it, but I guess I'll try. We, we've probably all been there at, at one point or another. How many ball teams have gone onto the court or onto the field well, you know, we've got to play these folks, but we know what's going to happen. They're going to smear us. Well, that, that's exactly the attitude right here. This defeatist attitude, they were discouraged before they ever began the process. Obstacles outweigh the opportunities in their own mind. That's easy too, isn't it? When we began to look at the task before us, do we see and do we focus in on, on all of the obstacles that we're going to face along the way? Or do we focus in on the opportunities that are presented to us in that regard? That's the way we are sometime in the church. When we begin to think about a new program, a new work, a new aspect of what do we want to do, well, we see all of the obstacles. And I've sat in a lot of business meetings through the years when there were always those present in those meetings who if you couldn't see the obstacles, they could help you see them. They always wanted to, to see the negative side of everything. That wasn't the case with Joshua and Caleb. And, and Caleb tries to, to encourage the people in this regard. And so notice what he says in verse 30. And here's, the, here's somewhat the challenge that Caleb lays before these people in this regard. Verse 30, And Caleb still the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. I want you to think about two or three aspects of this challenge that is found here. First of all, there is the challenge for unity. Unity. You notice the words that he uses in this regard? Let us. There's a cooperative effort for which Caleb is calling here. Let, let everybody. And you'll know, he says, for we. That, that includes himself. It includes Joshua. It includes everybody within the, within the Israelite nation at that point. So, so he's including, uses these plural pronouns here to include all the children of Israel in the challenge. He wanted everybody to be involved. 
How different is that today in the church of our Lord? What challenges has God given to us that we as God's people cannot face and meet successfully if we'll just do it God's way? Call for unity is great in this verse. You think about Acts chapter 8. Whenever the great persecution came on the church at the hands of Saul and others, what did we find? And they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Not, not just a select few, but they that were scattered abroad. I would take it that, that all of those who were scattered abroad were involved and engaged in that work of spreading the gospel wherever they went. That's the way we ought to be tonight. You see, the spread of the gospel is is not just for a select few people. It's not just for preachers and, and elders and, and Bible class teachers and deacons. The spread of the gospel is, is the responsibility of everybody. And sometimes when we look around and, and we want to focus in on a certain group of people and we want to say, well, you know, boy, this church is just not growing in numbers, is it? I, I remember a number of years ago, and I may relate to this to you at some point, but but this was even while I was back in college and worshiping with the congregation. And, and, and one Sunday afternoon, this lady came up to me, and she was obviously discouraged and distraught about the work of that church. And, and she began to talk about what the church is. Just, this church is not doing this, and this church is not doing that. And I listened to her for a few minutes, and I just turned to her, and I said, Do you always talk about yourself like this? She looked at me as if she didn't understand what I said. I said, do you always talk about yourself like this? You see, when you talk about this church, you're talking about yourself because you are part of this church. You have as much responsibility in this church as anybody else as far as evangelistic efforts are concerned. Yes, there are folks who have more time and preachers who are paid to do that kind of work, but, but it's not just their work. And so if, if a congregation is not growing numerically, then instead of looking at somebody else, why don't you look at yourself and say, what am I doing to try to bring about growth in this congregation? And you could talk about the same thing with regard to, to spiritual growth. If we don't think the church is growing, and I'm not suggesting now that, that anybody has made this complaint, that that's not it. I'm just trying to draw some lessons from this story. But what are we doing to, to bring about spiritual growth? What are we contributing to try to make other members of the congregation stronger? What are we doing to try to make our own selves stronger in that regard? And so when we look at <clears throat> what's happening here in the nation of Israel, and, and then we compare that to Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, they, that didn't even include the apostles, they stayed in Jerusalem. They that were scattered abroad, members of the church, went everywhere preaching the word. They weren't sitting around waiting for somebody else to do it. They were doing it themselves. Or you think about <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burden, verse 2, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Again, when we look at, at the affairs of God's people today, do we have a tendency to, <clears throat> to look at the elders and say, well, they're just not doing a whole lot to try to restore members who have become unfaithful. Now, I hear that accusation. I've heard it through the years. And I just think the elders need to be more involved in, in trying to restore folks who've fallen away. I just don't see them doing, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did Paul say in Galatians 6 1? Ye which are spiritual. Now, I don't see that exclusive of everybody but the elders. Do I consider myself spiritual? If I do, what am I doing? Don't be looking at what somebody else may or may not be doing. What am I doing to try to restore those who have fallen away? Don't be pointing fingers at, 
at somebody else. See, see, that's what's happening right here. That's what, that's what Caleb is calling for. Let us, let us go up at once. Let us do it. We are able to overcome the call for unity. Everybody pulling his own load in that regard. In James chapter 1 and verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to, to visit the fatherless and the widows and, in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Whose responsibility is it to have pure and undefiled religion? Well, that, that's the responsibility of every one of us, isn't it? And that involves visiting the, the fatherless and the widows. And the idea of visiting there is not just a casual stop by how are you kind of thing. It's to inspect as to the needs and then the, the efforts being made to fulfill those needs. You see, that's the responsibility of every one of us. I've often said, I don't, don't get the wrong idea, I, I'm, I'm not anti-programs, okay? But I do think it's a shame that we have to have programs in the Lord's church to get me as a Christian to do what God has already told me to do as a Christian. I think it's a shame that we have to have programs to get that done. But I know that's an expedient way, and that, that's okay. I'm not downing that. But if I have to have a program, an evangelism program to be, get me to be evangelistic, if I have to have a benevolent program to get me to be benevolent, if I have to have a, a wayward Christian seminar or something to get me stirred up to be working toward the, you know, there's just something wrong, isn't there? It's the responsibility of all of us in that regard. And, and when we work together in those kinds of things, it, it's amazing what would happen. So when we see Caleb saying to these people, let us, we are. He's really making a, a plea for unity in that regard. Now you come down to verse 31. But the men that went up with him said... We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Now you have the makings of division. When somebody says, we cannot do what God has told us to do, you have the making for division. Or if somebody says, we're not going to do what God has told us to do, you have the making for division. That's exactly the case in this regard. Now, you know, the question that I want to ask in that regard is, who's responsible for the division? Those who wanted to do what God said do, Joshua and Caleb, or those who spoke a contrary word? Reminds me of Elijah. When the king came to him, Thou art he that troubleth Israel. That was the accusation the king made against the prophet of God. The prophet of God wasn't troubling Israel. The prophet of God was trying to get Israel to do what was right. The king, who had no intention of doing what was right, was the one that was troubling Israel. So you see, sometimes we, we kind of get confused on who's the troublemaker and who's not. People are doing their best to do what the Lord wants done are not troublemakers. The people who want to go contrary to that are the troublemakers. They're the ones who are divisive in that regard. It wasn't Caleb. It wasn't his message. It wasn't the truth. Not at all. Chapter, 11, chapter 14, verse 11. The Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? <clears throat> How long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? Now keep in mind, all the way back down in Egypt. And actually, you can, you can begin with Joseph being sent down there. And when his brothers come down there and realized who he is and became afraid, Joseph said, hey, don't worry about it. You didn't send me down here. God did. Now, that was the hand of God. And then they're, they're being led out. All of those, those ten plagues that happened in the land, they're, those unbelievable events that happened relative to the Red Sea. There's no way to explain that outside the hand of God. They had seen all of this. They, they had known the, the mighty works they had done. So what's the problem here? 
It's the unbelief of those who have turned aside. And that's what he says. How long will it be? Or they believe me. What's he saying? They don't believe me. There's a, there's a big difference in, in belief and unbelief. And, and there's, the two just are not compatible. And so Joshua and Caleb in this regard are men who believe. Faith and belief, or faith and unbelief have, have little in common. You remember the, you remember the series of questions that, were, were, that are found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? Beginning down about verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Now these are questions that, which have answers that are obvious. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? The answer is obvious, none. What communion hath light with darkness? None. What concord hath Christ with Belial? None. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? None. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? None. There's just, there's just no mixing of those things. And so this matter of unbelief, the words of the ten spies is what caused the problem at this point. Now how is, how is unity with such people possible? I mean, here's, here's Joshua and Caleb, Caleb doing the speaking here. Let us go up at once, we're well able, so forth. And, and later on in, in chapter 14 and verse 9, he, he pleads with the people, don't rebel against God. They're, they're bred for us. Their, their defense has departed from them. The Lord is with us. Fear them not. That's his message. But now we've got division between Joshua and Caleb. How are we going to solve that? How are we going to solve that? Are we going to have Abel, uh, Caleb, are we going to have Caleb to alter his message? You see, that's, that's what people want us to do today when, whenever there's a divisive nature between those who are, who are holding to the truth and those who want to go in other directions. Well, you know, y'all just need to loosen up a little bit. Oftentimes, the word legalist is thrown around pretty easily. You're just a bunch of legalists. Just because we want to do what God says do, that's fine, call me what you will. I won't be faithful to God's word. So we can't have the message altered. Are we going to renounce his call? Come on, Caleb, back off. You can't expect these people to, to go in that land. That, you know, look, look at what we're going to face. Is that what we want to do? Back off the message? Surely that's not it. We want Caleb to stop saying what he's saying and say the same thing the ten spies are saying? Is that going to... Is that going to all that's going to be is compromise. It's not going to be unity. And so the lesson for our day relative to the unity and the division of this situation is Joshua and Caleb were standing on solid ground. And if there's to be unity, others who are not standing on solid ground are going to have to come and stand where they are. That, that's the only way unity can exist. I know that's not what we're hearing so much of today, but, but that's really what the case is in this regard. There, you know, there's so much overriding desire to, to ignore the truth. You, you, may have, you may have heard somewhere along the way, new hermeneutic, have you ever heard that expression before? That, that's a big old long word, hermeneutic. But all it means is means of interpretation. So, so we want to we want to begin a new means of interpreting things, and and usually by that people will say, you know, we, we need to redefine. And, and when you read a lot of a lot of the, the the change people that are promoting change in our society in our society in the church today, one of the first things that you'll notice is they're redefining terms to suit their position. That's not what we need here with regard to Caleb in this regard. We don't need to redefine anything. The Lord says, I will give you that land. Nothing else matters if God said, I will give you the land. It's theirs. 
All they've got to do is meet the conditions. And so, so when we look at this story and we, we see what's taking place, we don't expect Joshua and Caleb to change. All they're doing is saying, God's with us. We can do what God wants us to do. And it's no different today, folks. Whether it's the matter of reaching out to the lost of this community, whether it's the matter of trying to restore those who've fallen away, whether it's trying to be benevolent where there are benevolent situations, whether it's the visiting of the fatherless and the widows and their affliction, we need to listen to Caleb. We are well able to do it. How? Because God is with us as long as we do what he says do. Tremendous lessons in that regard. But he's making a call there for unity among those people. There are some other lessons we maybe talk about next Sunday evening from that context. But tonight, if you want to talk about unity, you have to begin at the beginning, and that is becoming a child of God. You, you can't talk about unity with God's people if you're not a child of God. So tonight, if you need to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you can do that based upon your faith, your desire to turn away from sin and confess that faith in Christ, you can be baptized. Then you're in a position to, to work in unity with, with all the other children of God, doing what God wants done. If you've allowed the world to cloud your sight and your thinking, and all you see are the obstacles out there. You see the giants. You see the walled and defense cities. You, you, see, you, you see the greatness of those people. If, that, if you, all you can see are the obstacles, you need to refocus. Because if God be for us, who can be against us? Ask God's forgiveness in your incorrect thinking and your incorrect action in that regard. And then begin to do what God wants us to do in every aspect of the Christian life as a member of the body of Christ. If you need to do either of those tonight, we'd be delighted to assist you as we stand together and sing the song.
Many thanks to those that are public part in our worship today. For those visiting, we're certainly glad you decided to be with us. You're our honored guest, and we invite you, invite you back to every opportunity that you may have to be with us. Please take a moment, fill out an attendance card. If you were not here this morning, leave that on the table in the foyer as you depart. Remind you of those that we announced this morning on our prayer list. You're asked to remember Betty Gray's mother, Addie Hunt. She's here with us tonight, and we're glad to see that. James Oaks is uh, doing much better now. We're glad to see him and his family here with us today. Eric Blank asked us to remember his dad, Jan Blank. He is still struggling from health difficulties. Al Jones is nearing the end of his treatments. Lord willing, Wednesday will be the last one, and hopefully that will be successful. And he will be uh, able to re resume a normal lifestyle and have to go to Carrollton every day. We've received a thank you note from Camp Inigahee on the bulletin board here in the hallway. Are there others that we should mention? Okay, several events. The egg hunt for the little ones, nursery through sixth grade, is uh, next Sunday morning. After the morning worship service, March the 25th, bring your own picnic lunch and plastic eggs. Several Brothers Keepers group events upcoming. Group four, this is Chris and, Chris and Stephanie's group, meets Saturday which is March the 24th, 5 p.m. at their home, at the home of Chris and Stephanie Hodges. See them for more information. Group one, Jimmy and Jan's group, will meet after the evening worship service next Sunday, March the 25th, at the house next door. There's a sign-up list in there for you for what to bring. Group two will meet, that's mine and Tammy's group, that will meet at Eric and Mary Blank's home uh, after the evening worship service next Sunday. Group three, Martin and Connie's group, will meet after the evening worship service in the fellowship hall. Finger foods are the fair there. The next area-wide singing is at the Rockmark Congregation, which is this coming Friday, March the 23rd. It begins at 7 o'clock. We'll take the van. If you want to ride the van, it'll leave here in the parking lot at 6 p.m. Friday afternoon, 6 p.m. The van will leave going to the area-wide singing in Rockmark, which is Friday this coming March 23rd, beginning at 7 p.m. And they usually feed us quite well, so if you're looking for a good reason to go other than the singing, they feed us well. So Ladies' Day at the McDonough Congregation next Saturday, March the 24th. The next area-wide Devo is next Sunday after the evening service at Tallapoosa, area-wide youth devotional at Tallapoosa after the evening, that is after the evening service, right? We'll get more detail there. <clears throat> The gospel meeting that starts next Sunday, no, beg your pardon, started today. The gospel meeting started today through the 22nd in Jacksonville, Alabama, Glenn Colley, the speaker. The gospel seminar, excuse me, a gospel seminar begins later on uh, next week, March the 22nd through the 24th, Cliff Goodwin, the speaker in Lafayette, Georgia. There's also a gospel meeting that begins next Sunday. We failed to announce this this morning, but there is a flyer on the uh, bulletin board here in the hallway, a gospel meeting that begins next Sunday, March the 25th through Wednesday the 28th, where the Phil Sanders is speaking at Adairsville, which is not that far from us. As you're hopefully well aware, Brother Sanders is coming to conduct our fall gospel meeting this year. So if you want to get a head start and see him live next, uh, next week, beginning Sunday, their services are the same time as ours on Sunday, but Monday through Wednesday, 7 p.m. in Adairsville, if you want to see Brother Sanders beginning next Sunday in Adairsville. A, week, uh, a couple of weeks after that, the gospel meeting at Villarica, April the 8th through the 12th, for the Barry Grider from uh, Memphis, Tennessee, is the speaker. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand to sing, go through this door, second door on the left, there will be someone there waiting to serve you. In our next service, Wednesday at 7, we hope to see each other at that time. Should we mention anything else? 103 is our final song. 103, if you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word.
me, please. Our loving, merciful, heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, this day that you've given us to come and to worship you, to sing praises unto you, and to learn more about your word. And God, we thank you so much for Brother Sidney, for the two lessons that he has presented with us, presented to us this morning. Pray that we will take those things that he has spoken to us and we'll apply them to our lives. And God, we pray that you will be with us as we go throughout our daily lives, that as we strive to live for you, that we'll be able to overcome temptations and let our light shine and we'll glorify you through everything we do, we say, and we think. And God, we pray that you'll please be with us and bring us back at the next appointed time. Watch over us and keep us safe. Forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.